Okay, now, uh, keep in mind the fact that, uh, basically, the <clears throat> acetylcholinesterase and acetylcholine are, are substances that occur naturally in the brain, but by using radio waves to stimulate them, they can be used to block neural impulses, uh, neural transmission, rather, between one nerve cell and another. Keep in mind the, uh, metaphor suggested by, I believe it's Mr. Deutsch, who uh, sug said basically that uh, it's like having too many cars on a uh, freeway, that uh, a that the stimulation of the acetylcholinesterase can block the transmission of a nerve, of, of a nerve impulse, rather, across a synapse, okay? Going back to where we controlled... Uh, Lawrence presents information here that there, I there was, and uh, keep in mind, this book was published in 1967. Uh, Lawrence presents information here that uh, there was already by that time a generator transmitter which could, using radio waves, cause the, uh, the excessive production of the neural transmitter and the subsequent blocking of the transmission of a nerve impulse across the synapse between nerve cells. Okay, again, synapse is a gap between nerve cells. There is already in use a small EDOM generator transmitter, transmitter which can be concealed on the body of the person. Contact with this person, a casual handshake or even just a touch, transmits a tiny electronic charge plus an ultrasonic signal tone which for a short while will disturb the time orientation of the persons affected. Not so precise or predictable a tool as RHIC, it can nevertheless be a potent weapon for hopelessly confusing evidence in the investigation of a crime, as we shall see. Continuing. A little later, Lawrence writes, We have seen that radio transmission can definitely produce meaningful stimulation of the brain. For RHIC, the response need not be even as complex as those we have read about. All that is necessary is a simple neuromuscular twitch activated by radio. One of the few glimpses we have been given by the scientific community of the ultra-miniaturized radio muscle stimulators was announced quietly by Dr. Wen Sing Ko, last name H-S-I-U-N-G-K-O, of the Case Institute of Technology in Cleveland. He admitted that receivers the size of shirt buttons were in the experimental stage, unquote. Receivers that could be buried in muscles and used to stimulate them internally. Dr. Coe's admission to the technical press comes years after the RHIC technicians had placed such implants in operation for less worthy motives than his. Dr. Coe's experiments are related to the work that has been done in Europe for many years to stimulate artificial limbs. His announcement of the extent to which the equipment has been miniaturized is no surprise to the researcher of information on RHIC implantations. Now, accepting the feasibility of this, the radio part of RHIC, let us move on to the hypno aspect. If the subject is placed under hypnosis and mentally programmed to maintain a determination eventually to perform one specific act, perhaps, for example, to shoot someone, it is suggested thereafter each time a particular muscle twitches in a certain manner, which is then demonstrated by using the transmitter, he will increase this determination even more strongly. As the hypnotic spell is renewed again and again, he makes it his life's purpose to carry out this act until it is finally achieved. Thus are the two complementary aspects of RHIC joined to reinforce each other and perpetuate the control until such time as the controlled behavior is called for. This is done by a second session with the hypnotist giving final instructions. These might be reinforced with radio stimulation in more frequent cycles. They could even carry over they could even carry over the moments after the act to reassure calm behavior during the escape period, as in the case of Oswald, or to assure that one conspirator would not indicate he was aware of the co conspirator's role or that he was even acquainted with him. This might serve to block so much as a mention of the other's name. So keep in mind that uh, basically what they do is they under hypnosis they induce someone to perform an act and then they place a small device in a muscle which when uh, in response to radio stimulation causes that muscle to twitch and every time that muscle twitches that reinforces the person's will to perform the given action up until the time the person performs the action okay keep in mind also that uh, this is written in 1967 and I guess there's no place uh, better than uh, right here in the Santa Clara Valley or dubbed the Silicon Valley the sort of center of the electronics industry would people be better aware of the tremendous work that's been done in terms of miniaturization in the time since. 
Okay, and I uh, just want to mention to you that you're listening to KFJC 89.7, Los Altos Hills. We're probably going to take a break in just a couple of minutes. We're going to read, I think, one more short article, um, and then we are going to take a brief break. Anyway, continuing on from where we controlled, RHIC is a very simple, albeit fiendish, combination of two known scientific tools joined in a sophisticated modification to produce a theoretically predictable result. RHIC is one procedure that can explain the events in Dallas. The questions in rebuttal to this stand come quickly to mind. Quote, can anyone, using RHIC or not, be hypnotized to commit a criminal act so brutal as murder? Isn't it true that one will not perform any act under hypnosis that one wouldn't in a perfectly uncontrolled state? The answer is simply no, Lawrence writes. Dr. Theodore Barber of Harvard University in the Journal of Psychology states that a good subject will commit antisocial or dangerous acts if first convinced by the hypnotist that his behavior is normal and proper. Such acts as, as one account of Dr. Barber's work puts it, as throwing acid at the experimenter. Quote, two recent extensive reviews of this problem have fa not failed to note that since the good subject accepts the hypnotist's words as a true statement, an unscrupulous hypnotist can induce the subject to commit antisocial acts, unquote. Again, the skeptic's retort may be all very well to theorize, but has it ever been proven that a person under hypnosis will actually do these things? The answer is an unqualified yes. Under the hypnotic spell of Bjorn Show Nielsen, 28-year-old Polly Hardrup walked alone into a bank in a suburb of Copenhagen in March of 1951. In the course of a hold-up that Show Nelson had, quote, controlled him to carry out, he calmly shot two bank employees to death. When he was caught, Hardrup confessed that he had done the killings under hypnosis. Tried in 1954, Hardrup was found guilty of manslaughter because he was hypnotized, quote, in a state of mental abnormality, unquote, and was committed to prison to a prison mental institution. Show Nelson was also convicted of Nielsen was also convicted of manslaughter quote through having planned and by various means including hypnosis instigated a hard group of the crimes unquote he was given a life term the fact that hypnosis was the tool of control was established by Dr. Paul J. Reiter one of Denmark's leading psychiatrists and an expert in hypnosis Okay, well, in the next section of the broadcast, we're going to examine this, this concept even more closely because this is a sticking point for a lot of people. A lot of people refuse to believe that somebody can be hypnotized into performing an antisocial act, even presuming that they could be hypnotized in the first place and activated um, to perform some act from a distance. We are going to be examining that at greater length, and we're going to be getting into some, uh, some nitty-gritty stuff and some very complicated but very fascinating uh, case histories of a couple of people. So don't go away. Uh, that'll be coming up in about four or five minutes when we return, and then after we finish that segment, we may be going fairly soon after that to the telephone. So stay tuned. This is Nip Tuck. Dave Emery and I will be back with the next section of Radio Free America following this short... Okay. Anyway, starting the second half then, and you remember we just had left off there with a discussion of, among other things, the uh, the possibility of the radio hypnosis, uh, radio-induced hypnosis being used to uh, force people to commit antisocial acts. Um, and in fact, the, the question of whether it, one could credibly say that people could commit antisocial acts under the influence of hypnosis if they were not inclined to commit these kind of acts in regular life. Now, reviewing very briefly what we've been uh, looking at so far, after a couple of very interesting articles suggesting, in which people suggested that they had been placed under mind control and had surgical implants which were controlling their thoughts, we took a look first. We took a look first of all at a fellow by the name of Jose Delgado, who had patterned a technique to uh, control behavior of animals and perhaps humans through the use of electrical implants in the brain. And we took a look at his the fact that his work was subsidized by the Office of Naval Research and the U.S. Office of Aeromedical Research. We also took a look at the fact that uh, it appears that his research was done well before the uh, time which he or, or journalists reported that it was done. And also at the fact that uh, Mr. Delgado is of a rather authoritarian frame of mind in that he does not feel that people have the right to... Uh, control their own minds, okay? That, in other words, man does not have the right to develop his own mind. Then we took a look at the development of a technique which has been in operation for quite some time called RHICEDOM, Radio Hypnotic Intracerebral Control, Electronic Dissolution of Memory. Now, RHIC basically entails 
hypnotizing someone to perform a given action than implanting a small electrical device in a muscle which would cause the muscle to twitch. When that muscle twitches, the person is conditioned to reinforce their will to perform the act which they have been hypnotized to perform. EDOM involves basically using radio waves to stimulate the production of acetylcholine, which is a neural transmitter which uh, basically permits a nerve impulse to travel across the synapse, the gap between two nerve cells. Uh, if anybody would like to ask us a question about exactly how that works, we can read you some of the text from where we control. It's extremely technical, so I thought... Uh, we, we thought really that, that it, it might be best to let go because it, it, it'll sound kind of like some gobbledygook on the air. But if you would like us to go into it, we'll, we'll, we'll do the best we can. It, it's extremely technical, and for that reason and the fact that it probably would not be terribly comprehensible over the radio, we elected to uh, sort of let that slide. But it, it, there is a very detailed and, te as I said, technical discussion in where we controlled as to exactly how that was done. So the technology, R-H-I-C, E-D-O-M, basically permits someone to hypnotize somebody to perform an action and to then reinforce the will to perform that action by remote control. E-D-O-M enables them, again, by remote control, to basically erase someone's time sense by blocking neural transmitters in the brain. Again, too much acetylcholine, apparently, uh, functions just like the too many cars on a freeway. It blocks traffic. Now, one question that uh, has consistently come up and uh, is the fact that can someone, is, is the question of whether or not someone can be hypnotized to perform an action which uh, they would not normally do. Many critics uh, who have suggested that mind control is impossible have uh, cited uh, the allegation that someone cannot be hypnotized into doing something they would not ordinarily do as a, uh, a means of rebutting the notion that mind control is possible. Well, we're going to be uh, going to read you a section now from a book called Operation Mind Control. Operation Mind Control was published in soft cover by Dell Books, and it's authored by Walter Boart, B-O-W-A-R-T. As I said, published by Dell Books, copyrighted 1978. And what uh, Boart points out here is the fact that Although someone might not be able, might although someone might not be able to be hypnotized into doing something, uh, say shooting someone that they would that they like, say someone would uh, would not even under hypnosis be uh, could not be convinced to shoot someone that they normally held in high regard. They most definitely could be convinced under hypnosis that this person is in fact somebody else who they would shoot, and then the person will go ahead and shoot them. And that's important to remember. You may not be able to be hypnotized into shooting your mother, but you could be convinced that that, that, that your mother was in fact someone else who you would, would be quite willing to shoot and you, that who you would then go ahead and shoot. Again, reading from Operation Mind Control, Walter Boart, copyrighted 1978. In 1947, J.G. Watkins induced criminal behavior in deeply hypnotized subjects during an Army experiment. Watkins suggested a distorted view of reality to his subjects by inducing hallucinations which allowed them to avoid direct conflict with their own moral concepts. He carefully chose his suggestions to be in line with his subjects' pre-existing motivational structures and so was able to induce so-called antisocial behavior. Watkins took a normal, healthy army private, a young man whose tests indicated a most stable personality, and put him in a deep trance. Though merely striking a superior officer is a court-martial offense in the army, Watkins wanted to see if he could get his subject to strangle a high-ranking officer. After the subject was deep into trance, Watkins told him that the officer sitting across from him was a Japanese soldier who was trying to kill him. Interrupting, keep in mind, this is 1947, right after World War II. He must kill or be killed, Watkins suggested. And immediately, the private leapt ferociously, ferociously at the officer and grabbed him by the throat. In his waking state, the private would have been aghast at the thought of trying to strangle a superior officer. But under hypnosis, believing the officer was a dangerous Japanese soldier, the young private had to be pulled off his superior by three husky assistants. The officer came within a hair's breadth of being strangled, as the young man was most persistent in his attempt to kill what he regarded as the enemy. Watkins repeated this experiment with other subjects. The second time, he used two officers who were good friends. One of them was given the hypnotic suggestion that the other was a Japanese soldier and that he must kill or be killed. 
The man who had received the command not only made a powerful lunge at his friend, but as he did, he whipped out and opened a concealed jackknife, which neither the doctor, his assistants, nor his friend knew he had. Only the quick action of one of his assistants, who was a judo expert, prevented a potentially fatal stabbing. In both cases, reality was so distorted that the subjects took murderous and antisocial action. If they had accomplished their defensive acts on...